It's a real honor to be here with AAPS and be part of the fight for medical freedom for our patients and for all of us who take the oath of Hippocrates very seriously. And that was one of the reasons that I resigned from the insurance contracts in 1986, because I felt that they were asking me to sell out my patients and I couldn't do it. I couldn't sleep at night. So I told my husband, who just helped get me through medical school, sorry, <laughs> um, if I can't make this work independent of these contracts, I gotta find another career. So we, we have stood for what we believed in and he has helped in that fight. And I want to encourage all of the medical students in the room, do not sell your soul to the insurance company devil. If, thank you, if you answer to your patients, they will honor you with having you be their physician. And they will appreciate that you only answer to them. And what's interesting, as I look back on the journey, it would have been impossible to make the connections that I've made for this almost, uh, what, 27, 25 years in this connect the dots, individualized care, bringing together elements of reproductive endocrinology with traditional internal medicine that was my base. I couldn't have done it following the insurance company guidelines and what they would let me do for my patients. And what I've done over the years conforms with the international research, and I want to encourage many of you as we talk about men today, I want to encourage many of you to look up the journal, The Aging Male. This is the official journal of the International Society for the Study of the Aging Male with extraordinary research. The June issue alone has excellent studies on the connection between obesity and low testosterone in men, and also studies from Europe about the widespread problems, even in Europe, um, where they have a slimmer population than in America. So that is an outstanding resource for you with what's going on in the international field, which is where I've been focusing my CME for so many years. And as a result of that, let me give you an update. Last year, I'm going to take five minutes and talk a little bit about a couple of things that are a follow-on from last year, because it relates to the healthcare debate today. Last year, I gave a talk on flawed government guidelines run amok. It ties in very much with what Richard Ammerling talked about and what Adam Smith has talked about in the Women's Health Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a massive NIH press conference in 2002 that was a tsunami that rocked the world and affected women's lives and those who love them and medical research in women's health around the world when Jacques Rousteau called the press conference to announce the flawed interpretation of the Women's Health Initiative. In March 2007, the new data was published in Britain, not the US, showing that 12 years of follow-up with the women on estrogen alone, the same women from the Women's Health Initiative, had a 63% lower risk of breast cancer than the women taking no hormones at all, a 46% percent lower risk of heart disease than women taking no hormones at all, and a 50 percent lower risk of all-cause mortality. Did any of you hear a press conference to announce the mistake of the government-funded study? There wasn't one. Philip Sorrell at Yale has calculated that 
60,000 women in the United States alone died over the last decade as a result of the exaggerated risk of the Women's Health Initiative government study and the sudden recommendation of the FDA and many national medical organizations for women to stop their hormones. Ignoring years of international data to the contrary and ignoring the flaws of the study. I, I got on a plane and went to Europe right after that announcement in July to hear what the European experts had to say because I knew this just was, could not be true, that this was so bad. And we had a four-day conference with the European leaders and some of the more outspoken US leaders dissecting the flaws. Never have we had accountability by the investigators or the NIH on the damages that have been done. So what's happening? Let's talk death statistics. 500,000 women every year die of heart disease. We're going to talk about parallels with men, which is, could be helped with the right hormone therapy. 50,000 women every year suffer a hip or spine fracture. 20% of hip fracture patients die in three months. 90,000 women a year die of diabetes-related complications. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the incredible iceberg in women's health. That is the war on women's health. And it is being cut. Those services for those older patients are being cut under the Medicare cutbacks with the 2010 health care law. And yet they claim that women's health is abortion paid by the taxpayers and free contraceptives that have been available my whole career at $4 a month at Walmart. So look at the cost to people's lives and to our society when we lose productive people, all of those deaths I've just talked about, all of those women who could be produ productive citizens who mean something to their families, dying prematurely because of flawed guidelines, flawed, exaggerated risk in the press conference, and not a willingness to do the accountability of having a press conference to announce, whoops, we were wrong, and here's what the findings now show. It was published overseas. I think this is unconscionable, and I hope that all of you will get even more involved in the fight to preserve medical freedom and answer to your patients and rebut the kinds of guidelines that you've been hearing about from other speakers as well as me. Now, let's talk about men because What's interesting as I reflect on this is that my work actually began at Johns Hopkins in 19, early 1980s as resident, and I was privileged to work with a world-renowned team on the sexual consultation program, where we were evaluating men and women with sexual function disorders who came to Hopkins from all over the country and around the world. It was a phenomenal experience as a resident. What was fascinating to me, two things. Number one, with the men, we always checked testosterone levels. We didn't check hormone levels in the women. Now I reflect on how nonsensical that is. In addition, at the time we were part, we were doing this research protocol on erectile dysfunction and the team, multidisciplinary team, was developing it. Erectile dysfunction was considered to be a psychological disorder in 95% of patients. So the team set out, we had a different hypothesis that we felt there were unrecognized medical causes and the team set out to find out about that. By the time I had finished my residency, 
The work, which was published later, the, all of this work from the whole team, the team had come to the conclusion that better than 90% of erectile dysfunction in males was medical. And less than around 10% was truly psychogenic. Major shift. Now, it took a long time for that to get out into the public arena and into clinical practice. And actually, what helped that was the development of a medication addressing some of the vascular aspects, with the first drug being, of course, Viagra. But circle back to testosterone for men, because Viagra doesn't treat a testosterone deficiency. Viagra and others, Levitra and Cialis, only address the vascular component. So what were some of the medical causes that we found that were associated, this was in the early 80s, now we have more data on that, but in the early 80s what we were finding was that the biggest cause of erectile dysfunction in males was unrecognized diabetes. Alcohol use, antihypertensives, and a variety of other medical problems were totally unrecognized as causes of erectile dysfunction. So that was the beginning of my work in the hormone field, was really with men. And then over the years, I've focused more on the, the needs for women from puberty to menopause and beyond. But what's been interesting in the last 10 years more of my women patients have been saying, Dr. Vliet, I see such a difference in how I feel, and I'm seeing some of the same things in my husband that I came to you for. Do you treat men? I said, well, yeah, I've treated men my whole career. I just don't advertise it, and, and I, don't, I, I don't make a big deal out of it. Um, so, well, could you see my husband, or could you see my son, or could you see my brother, or my father? And so what has been interesting in then getting involved with the International Society for the Study of the Aging Male and going to those meetings, it turns out that there's just, again, erectile dysfunction is the tip of the iceberg. And what is the rest of the iceberg that is totally falling between the cracks, totally falling between the cracks, is all of these men, and conservative estimates are eight to 10 million American men alone, suffer from low testosterone and don't know it. And the staggering aspects are what I put on the back of your little handout and you'll have a homework assignment at the end of my talk. I always give my audiences, whether they're at healthcare town halls or medical meetings, you have a homework assignment. So go take this little quiz, and if it's relevant to you, then you need to be talking with your doctor and you need to read the journal articles that I've just uh, mentioned. But on the back of that is a summary of what some of the current research has shown are the associations with low testosterone. 74% of chronic pain patients on daily opioid medications have low testosterone. 52% of obese patients, males, have low testosterone. 50% of those with I think that one was AIDS, have low testosterone. We're looking at 40% of people with hypertension and 42%, 40% of those with hyperlipidemia having low testosterone. And that is a specific side effect of statin medications that block cholesterol synthesis and block the building block that your body needs to make the testosterone. So all these men that are walking around being treated by the cardiologist to get their testosterone, excuse me, their cholesterol down as low as possible 
are also now, five or six years later, walking around with low testosterone and don't know it because no one's screening for these comorbid, in these comorbid conditions, it's not the standard to screen for low testosterone. So here, here are huge numbers of patients walking around this country that don't realize they have a treatable endocrine problem that's aggravating other conditions. Now, the flip side of that is that low testosterone, the current research, again, much of it published in the international journals, shows that low testosterone itself increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, and even increases the risk of prostate cancer. Now raise your hand if you were taught, as I was, that taking testosterone increases the risk of prostate cancer. Okay, that's pretty much everybody in the room. How many of you have been taught that testosterone increases the risk of a heart attack in men? Okay. The data shows dramatically otherwise. I just said, I hope you heard me, low testosterone increases the risk of later prostate cancer. Now let me define that because I've, I've been privileged to work with some world-renowned urologists on this and know what they have been presenting. Testosterone levels below 200 in men contribute to a 20% increase in risk of prostate cancer. 20%. And people say to me today, it's too expensive to check testosterone. Are you kidding me? It's a simple blood test. Now I'll talk to you about how you test to do it right in a few minutes. It's a simple blood test. We look at the cost of untreated or poorly treated diabetes, look at the cost of hypertension, look at the cost of hyperlipidemia, look at the cost of depression or dementia or any of these other problems that are increased in men over time with low testosterone. And that's the cost. What about the most important thing of all, life, and quality of life. Well, it turns out life is shortened as well. Over 17 years, one of, the, one of the studies showed unequivocally that men with testosterone levels of 200 or below had twice the risk of death from all causes, three times the risk of cancer deaths now that's not getting cancer and being treated, that's death. And twice the risk of cardiac deaths. Gee, and one of the things that we do in treating men with prostate cancer is block the testosterone and drive it lower. That's the standard of care. Do you know? what the studies have actually found, the men on hormone blockers die sooner. It all fits if you connect the dots from these different studies in different fields. So just like Dr. Smith and Dr. Ammerling have talked about, here is another area where the government guidelines, one size fits all, are costing people their lives and costing the rest of us and the patients a lot of money that could be reduced if we properly evaluated and diagnosed the patients. Now, what about the pattern of decline? Study, we've been taught in medical school, and I suspect most of you probably were taught this, that testosterone, that menopause hits women average age of 51, but men don't lose testosterone until much later in life. Turns out that's wrong too. The international studies are showing the beginning of the testosterone decline for men starting at about age 30. And it progressively increases every year 
until by age 65, men have lost 40% of their total and free testosterone, 40%. Now, when you lose testosterone, men start losing a few other things. And the focus in the ads and the focus in our culture has been on sexual function. But let's talk about some other organ systems that you don't hear about. Men start losing muscle. They start losing bone. They're at increased risk of osteoporosis. I just had a patient not long ago who'd had a hip fracture in his early 60s. That's unheard of. But he had low testosterone, had been low for a long time apparently, because he was severely osteoporotic. And they, so not only do they lose muscle and lose bone, they lose cognitive edge, memory is affected, concentration, attention, focus. And the more that you gain, and they gain belly fat, the more belly fat you gain, the more insulin resistant you are, and the more estrone is produced in the body fat, and the more sex hormone binding globulin is produced, and then guess what? The free testosterone goes even further down, which causes more muscle loss and more body fat. It is a horrible, vicious cycle for older men. Now, why are we seeing it in younger population? I have some speculation on that. A lot of it is the obesity in adolescents that is decreasing free testosterone in these young men. A lot of it is alcohol use. Alcohol increases estrone in the body fat, increases sex hormone binding globulin, and you get more and more body fat. It also decreases testosterone production. Kids and young adults and even the baby boomers who thought they were so cool smoking pot, pot is estrogenic. And pot decreases testosterone production and it decreases sperm production and it also causes breast development in men. So pot is really not, marijuana is really not that innocuous or benign and yet so many people think that it is. So I think we're seeing earlier onset of the testosterone decline in males in part from some of the lifestyle factors and lack of exercise because when you exercise your muscles are actually helping to to convert some of the estrone and body fat and and to get rid of that and also there are pathways in exercising muscle that help to increase testosterone. So there are a lot of interesting aspects of this. I think we're seeing a lifestyle problem. I think we're seeing the medical community not being taught to screen for these things in men with these comorbid conditions. And we are seeing increasing use of medications that lower testosterone. I mentioned statins, antidepressants lower testosterone. They can increase prolactin. Hardly anybody checks for prolactin, but when prolactin goes up in men, testosterone goes down. And many things don't work as well. H2 receptor blockers also increase prolactin. How many of you have patients on the H2 receptor blockers? I know people do. Anyway, they, <laughs> they, that can increase prolactin. You're, you're looking at many of the mood stabilizer medications. They now are called mood stabilizers. They used to be called neuroleptics or and now atypical antidepressants, Abilify is being widely advertised. All of these drugs can increase prolactin. So I think we are looking at an unrecognized epidemic in men's health that as we see the aging population will become as evident as what I've described in women's health. Let's look at the demographics. And if you wanna talk about cost implications alone of overlooking these issues, consider these statistics. In the year 1900, we had three million men over 65. In the year 2000, we had 
30 million men over 65. By the year 2030, we expect to have 70 million men over 65. That is more than double the men living to that age in the year 2000. And what are we doing? We are not screening these men now. We're cutting back under Obamacare on prostate cancer screening. The cost alone are gonna go through the roof as we have older men suffering the same, living long enough now to suffer the same debilitating problems of later life that women do as a result of losing these key metabolic hormones. So I, and that doesn't even get at the fact that they're gonna die sooner. So it, the government guidelines are a threat to life they're a threat to other people's economic freedom, if you're gonna to have to pay for all of this. And they're a threat to the patient's economic freedom. Older people today are not planning the financial needs that they will have to take care of the consequences of these types of disorders. So, as the previous speaker said, you're left with two options. You either ration care and you use the Liverpool pathway to kill people, get them out of the way so they don't take the resources, or you've got to go back to having the physician-patient relationship being able to contract privately and be independent of all of these flawed guidelines. There are no other options, really. Now, let's talk Quickly, there's, there's a lot to address with proper testosterone replacement for men. There are some risks that don't get talked about very much. You hear the wrong information about the risk. Oh, it's gonna increase prostate cancer. No, that's not the case. It doesn't. There've been studies to show that. There've been studies to show that um, men who've been treated for prostate cancer can safely go back on it later, and Dr. Steidel at the University of Indiana has some excellent data on that. So it doesn't increase the risk of prostate cancer, but one of the things that it does do, and this is a much more serious risk actually, testosterone increases erythropoietin production in the kidney, which can be a good thing in renal patients, it, it can be a good thing in AIDS patients, it can be a good thing in men with anemia. It is not a good thing, however, with men who already have fairly high hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood cell counts. Because what can happen, and this is particularly prevalent with the injectable testosterone therapies, and there are studies to show that, you, st you stimulate the erythropoietin production too much and you overstimulate the production of red blood cells, the hematocrit goes up, the blood becomes more viscous, and you're at high risk for stroke. Plus men, I've noticed, um, being around brothers and my husband for 44 years, tend not to drink a lot of water. And <laughs> they don't like going to the bathroom. And so when men on testosterone are not careful about hydration, and they're not monitoring their, their CBCs, you're a setup for stroke, particularly as you get older. Now, what disturbs me is that I have, I've had a number of people say to me, oh, I think I'm gonna take some testosterone, or I've had patients say to me, well, I went to see this guy, and um, he's given me an injection, and I said, oh, okay, so you feel better, yes. I notice it wearing off, <laughs> then I don't feel so good. I said, well, have they been checking your blood counts? Oh no, he said there wasn't anything to worry about. Well, there is one of the really serious risks of testosterone therapy. You really have to monitor the CBC on a regular basis. It's not expensive. 
but a stroke is devastating. So we hear a lot about the wrong risk and we don't hear enough about the real risk. The, the concern is overstimulation of prostate growth, stimulation of an existing cancer, and then the erythrocytosis. So those are things to think about. Now, in wrapping up, there's, there's a lot on this. The journals I've given you have articles. We have some articles and a podcast on my website. Testing for testosterone. Testosterone is carried in the bloodstream as bound to sex hormone binding globulin, free and able to unbound and able to activate the receptor sites, and weakly bound to albumin. That's called the bioavailable testosterone. It turns out that the latest research in the field shows that both the, weak, the free and the weakly bound form in the bloodstream are available to activate the testosterone receptors. So you do have to take that into account. So morning blood draw, usually best between 7 to 8 a.m. That's going to be your most reliable time to draw it. And you want to order the total and the free and preferably weekly bound as well. The definition of low testosterone is a testosterone below 300 nanograms per deciliter, a free below 50 picograms per milliliter, and a bioavailable less than 70. And the current guidelines from the endocrine societies and ISOM all recommend treatment of those patients for all the reasons we've talked about. Clinical judgment should come into play with testosterone, morning testosterone levels between three and 400 because there are many men who will benefit medically, I'm not just talking about sexual function, will benefit medically on the insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome, blood pressure, um, that lipids, all of those things, if they're given testosterone to keep them above the 400. That's the area of clinical judgment. Now, we have several FDA-approved bioidentical testosterone products on the market. The two that, that are the most physiologic in terms of morning, daily application, rise and peak in blood level over the course of the day, falling overnight, which is the circadian rhythm, would be the two gel products. There's a third one about to come on the market. Testem and Androgel. Testem has a permeation enhancer that helps drive the hormone through the skin more effectively. And head-to-head -head studies have shown that it does give better blood levels, better clinical response. And I've certainly seen that in my patients. They uh, have not had as much success with the Androgel product. Testem does have a strong aroma, however. So for those who are sensitive to fragrances, it can be a drawback. The injectables and pellets that are on the market, while they can work, the injectables, as they as the manufacturer says they should be used monthly or every two weeks, give a sharp spike in blood level and an unpredictable fall off. So the studies have shown a peak and valley sawtooth kind of effect. What the families of patients on injections tell me is they can be really angry at the beginning and really irritable and depressed and lethargic toward the end of the shot. So there are ways to work with that, but the point is you don't have the same stability in delivery. And what I would like to, as we need to wrap up to stay on time, there, there's so much that we can talk about on this, but I will just share with you, testosterone therapy has helped. I've had patients from their early 20s with severe metabolic syndrome who needed to have some testosterone added back along with other treatments. I've had patients, a uh, software engineer in his early 50s was losing his edge and risking losing his job. And an older, several older men who felt they were losing their muscle strength and their, their cognitive sharpness. And it's really heartwarming to hear their responses. The, the computer engineer, software engineer, called me back about a month later and he said, 
wow, I can't believe it. I didn't expect to feel so much better so fast. And sleeping better, mood better, cognitive edge and sharpness all better. That's even beyond the other things we've talked about. The key is physiologic delivery, stable delivery, reliable products, some of the compounded ones that I've seen with, from patients or worked with myself tend to have, they don't have some of the ingredients that drive it through the skin. You get more skin conversion to DHT and you don't get some of the benefits that you need. So they're, they're trickier to work with and they're not covered on insurance for many people. So the others are. So those options are all available. I encourage you to read about this, to think about it for your, your patients and look at the risk of going untreated. And for the guys in the room who are physicians who may be tempted to just say, oh, I think I'm gonna take a little bit of that, I would encourage you not to do that. Testosterone is a controlled drug and you can lose your medical license for prescribing it for yourself. See someone outside, get a, get a proper evaluation. All the guidelines are, are in the material on my website and others. ISAM has some great articles. Do it right and monitor, if you don't hear anything else I said today, don't just monitor the PSA, monitor your CBC. That's what can kill you sooner than prostate cancer. And if you do it all right, I would encourage you to enjoy healthy aging with a lot of zest and vitality that you thought you'd lost. So thank you. <laughs>